Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about implementing variables in our language. Um, this is a functional language, so variables are kind of misnamed. Uh, everything is immutable. So it's more just like giving names to values. You can't actually change the values later, but that's fine. Um, and so since we're starting to get into like real programming language features, whereas like before we just had something where you type a constant and echoes it back, that's not very interesting. We're starting to get into real language features. So we're going to take some time today to talk about formal semantics, which is uh, basically a formalization of how programs execute so that we can talk you know, formally about what it means to execute various kinds of statements and what it means to evaluate expressions, et cetera. Um, and then we'll see that when we have rules, formal semantics rules, it's very easy to turn them into code. Uh, and we'll look at the rules that we've already implemented in the code that we wrote for them, and you'll see that they, they look very similar. Um, and then I'm also going to do something a little bit different this week. Uh, you might notice I'm in a different room. Um, I'm back on campus now and I have a different setup. So I actually have my laptop uh, in front of another monitor. And so I can actually share my whole screen now because I can have my reference code up on the other monitor and I don't have to worry about uh, showing that. So uh, I'm going to share my whole screen today and hopefully that will be a little bit better. Um, but before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about why we would, why we would want semantics. So uh, I said already that when you have semantics rules, it's often very easy to turn them into code. Uh, the other reason that you want semantics is because it gives you a way to write down the rules of your language. And whenever you're writing something down, uh, A, you can sanity check them, right? So if something looks wrong, you're a lot more likely to notice when it's written down as a semantics rule than when it's written down in code. Um, and B, it's a lot easier to read semantics rules than it is to read code. And so when you're talking with somebody else about the semantics of a programming language, especially if it's a new programming language, it's a lot easier to talk about it in terms of semantics rules. Um, and then the other thing is uh, semantics rules also just kind of like look better. So uh, you're going to see if you keep going in programming languages and you look at implementations of other languages, especially functional languages like Haskell and OCaml, uh, you'll see that they give the formal semantics of their programming language at some point in their source code, uh, probably in a PDF file somewhere. Um, Haskell does, OCaml does, uh, SMLNJ does. Uh, the scheme standard actually gives formal semantics in the standard itself. So like this is a, this is a very common thing that you're going to see a lot. So um, with that, uh, off to the side. The important things that, and I, I know I'm not sharing my screen yet, that's intentional. The important things that semantics need to tell us is a semantics rule needs to tell us what kind of statement it evaluates or what kind of expression it evaluates, uh, the environment that it evaluates that expression in, so uh, what variable names are bound to what values, uh, what variables have what types, um, et cetera. Um, it needs to tell us what things we have to evaluate first. So for example, if you're evaluating an operator expression, you have to evaluate both of the operands before you can evaluate the call, right? Three plus five plus four, you can't do that all at once. You need to do like either three plus five first and then plus four, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then it tells us what the result is. So there's, there's like uh, four parts, it, it varies a little bit. So uh, I think it's a little bit easier to think of it as three parts. So the first part is the thing we're evaluating and what environment we're evaluating it in. The second part is the things that we need to do first. And then the last part is the result. Okay. Um, and I say that first because in the notation, it's not always clear exactly what's going on if you don't know what to look for. So I'm going to share my screen now. This is my whole screen. Hello. Okay. Um, and so we have three types of semantics rules. Uh, the first types of rules, I titled the section. So the first rules are for types. So this is for like type inference and type checking. Oh, sorry, can you zoom in on this a little bit? Can it's I zoom little, in? Little yes. Uh, da, da, da. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So the top two rules are for type checking and actually our language is going to have type inference. So as we progress, the rules will uh, explain how to do type inference as well. These two rules are for expressions. These rules are for statements. So I'm going to actually start with expressions because I think they're the easiest to understand. And I'm going to pull up this little annotate thingy that Zoom has, which is really cool. So, okay, I said there were three parts. So the first part of a rule is what are you evaluating and what environment is it in? So that's this part right here. Um, the angle brackets are just kind of notation. I don't know where that comes from. 
the thing you're evaluating, oh, whoops, comes before the comma. That wasn't any better. Oh, well, I'm going to give up. And the expression that you're evaluating it in is the thing that comes after the comma. That's the sigma. OK, so sigma is an environment. The things that you need to do first go above the line. You'll notice that neither of these rules have anything above the line. That's because uh, they're types of rules that we call axioms. Um, they give you an evaluation for free. There's nothing that you need to do first. Right? Constants just evaluate to themselves. You don't have to do anything. And variables, you just look them up in the environment. You don't have to do anything. Um, oh, hello. Nope, I don't want you. Hang on. Annotate is stopping me from closing that. OK, there we go. Um, OK, so the other thing you might notice is this rule has what's called a side condition. So this rule only applies if this condition is true. This means if there's a binding for u in sigma and it binds u to v. Um, if the side condition isn't satisfied, then we're just going to crash. Uh, in the future, when we add errors to the language, we will do something a little bit better. We'll produce uh, an error message. Um, but for now, we're just going to like fail to evaluate it, and we won't explain why. So sorry, I said the interpreter would crash. That's not true. We'll just fail to evaluate the thing. Um, but later, we will actually give a semantics for uh, if, the, if the variable isn't in the environment, we'll evaluate to an error, that kind of thing. Um, OK, so next I'm going to talk about types because they're also axioms. So that's a little bit easier. So types are kind of the same thing syntactically, but the things come in a different order because type theorists and programming language theorists like to disagree about things, I guess. Um, so here, the first part is this thing. Uh, but now, instead of having the, uh, the thing that you're looking at on the left and the environment on the right, it's in the other order. So gamma is what's called a typing environment. And then you can read this turnstile as proofs. And then the thing on the right of the turnstile is what you're looking at. So this says gamma proves C. And then you can read the colon as has type. So Gamma can prove that C has the type, type of C. And this rule is for constants. So when we have a constant, we, we know what its type is, right? If we have an integer constant, it's an int, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so actually, if you watch the video from last week, we implemented this type of function in the code. So it's there. Um, and then this rule on the right is pretty much the same thing as the expression rule, right? It says gamma proves that x has type tau if the typing environment says that x has type tau, same as when we evaluate a variable, right? Uh, we evaluate the variable u to the value v if the binding for u in sigma is v, right? So uh, ooh, I almost pressed the stop share button. So it's the same kind of thing. Oh, wait, uh, I closed the annotate. I wanted to clear it, not close it. Uh, OK, there we go. OK, so yeah, same kind of thing. On the left, you have the thing that you're evaluating or inspecting or whatever. Then there's some symbol that says, uh, you know, in this case, it has type. The down arrow you can read as evaluates to. So, and then the thing on the right is the result. So here it's type of C, here it's tau, here it's V, here it's C, right? Constants evaluate to themselves. Does anybody have any questions about this? The other two rules are a little bit messier, so I want to wait to talk about those. This is like pretty theoretical stuff. So if you have questions, that's OK. OK, doesn't seem like it. Um, so I'm just going to move on. So before we talk about the statement stuff, um, I think we should go ahead and just implement the type checking and expression rules. So uh, this is the stuff that we already had, the constants. So I'm going to move this off to the side and bring up the code that we already had. And we'll, oh, come on, go away. There we go. And we can look at how we implemented those rules already. So here's the editor. Please move this window away from the shared application. What does that mean? Wait, hang on. I think Zoom got mad at me. Let me restart the screen share. OK, there we go. Can you guys see this? Yes. OK, good. OK, so oh, this uh, weird. OK, eh, actually, that's fine. All right. So first, we don't care about types. So let's just skip past. Or sorry, we don't care about parsing. So let's skip to types. Um, OK, here we go. So the constant rule 
can see we already implemented here as type check of a constant is type of C. And there's nothing that we have to do first, right? So, um, but you'll notice there, there's no typing environment here. We're going to fix that today. Um, and then here's a type of function, which we wrote last week. If you didn't watch the video, that's okay. It's very simple. <clears throat> and then this is the evaluate rule for constants, which you can see is very similar, but instead of returning a type, it just returns the, the constant as a value, right? So constants evaluate to themselves. Does everybody see how these, uh, these two functions are just implementations of these rules? Doesn't seem like there's any confusion. OK. Um, we'll see some slightly more involved rules today when we talk about statements. And then you'll see how the stuff above the line comes into play. Um, but for now, these are just axioms, right? There's no real work to do. So OK. Um, if we want to add, uh, if we want to add variables, the first thing we need is we need environments, right? Type checking needs a type environment. Evaluating needs an expression environment. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back up above the parsing code, and we're going to add a new section with uh, wait, I don't do it that way. Uh, with some stuff for uh, dealing with environments. So I'm just going to call this environments. Uh, and this is super simple. So we basically did this when we talked about simply type lambda calculus already, right? Environments map a name to something. Uh, but we're also going to give two special types of environments names. So gamma is a type environment, and sigma is a value environment. So, um, and then we want the same utility functions that we had for simply type lambda calculus, except this time I'm not going to implement them by hand, I'm just going to use the standard library stuff. So this function's in the standard library, but it takes the arguments in the other order. So there's a standard library combinator that we can use that changes the order of the arguments of a function called flip. So if, oh, that's a type error, uh, flip, look up, okay. stop complaining. So if you look at the type at the bottom of my screen down there, you can see it says it takes a function that takes two arguments of types A and B and returns a function that just takes the arguments in the other order. So this is a combinator. We talked about combinators before. And then we also want a function for inserting into the environment. And if anybody has any questions about this, just interrupt me and ask. Um, and then I'm going to write this function now, but I don't actually think we need it today. It's just convenient to have, and we'll need it later. Whoops. Uh, so since our environments are just lists, to take the union of two environments, uh, all we have to do is append them. Um, you might say, well, what if there's conflicts, right? What if, um, what if both of the environments contain bindings for the same name? Uh, so lookup env looks from left to right. So that means when we union environments this way, we're implicitly saying that if there's a conflict, you should use the one from the left argument. And that's actually going to be what we want later, because in the future, when there's like name shadowing going on, potentially, um, if we just put the binding on the left and look it up first, then eventually, if you think of the environment kind of as a stack, at some point we push it on, at some point we're going to pop it off. And as soon as we pop it off, the name that was there before is now visible again. And that's what we want. Um, and I think we might have talked about that when we did simply type lambda calculus too. So just to reiterate, um, OK. So let's, uh, yeah. OK, so now let's go, oh, that wasn't far enough. OK, let's go down to the type checking. OK, so now we want not just an expression, but we also want a typing environment. And so for consistency, I'm going to put the environment second uh, for both things. And then for this rule, we ignore it, right? We don't care what the environment has. For evaluating, we want a value environment. And this rule also doesn't care what's in it. OK, so now these rules are maybe uh, a little bit closer to the semantics on the left, right? So now there's, now there's a gamma that we don't care about and a sigma that we don't care about. So OK. What about variables? So that, that was the meat of what we're doing today. So in order to do variables, we're going to need to do the same thing we did for strings when we want to add a new uh, 
feature to the language. So first we have to add it to our data types. So expressions can now be variables. Um, variable names are just strings. Um, I'm sorry, I have to jump around my reference code a lot for this part. So I might be going a little slow. La -dee -da. Uh, let's go down here. Okay. And so now uh, expressions are no longer just constant expressions, right? So now um, expressions might be variables. So we add a case for that. And we're going to have to implement the parse var function. Um, that's okay. So let's see, where do I want to do that? Let's do that at the bottom. Uh, actually, I should match my reference code, which does it after parse const. So let's do it here. Uh, okay, so parse var is var x, and then we need a string. But we don't want to parse a string because the parse string function that we wrote last week parses a string literal, like with double quotes and escape characters. That's not what we want. We just actually want some slew of characters. Uh, and we also want to make sure that it's non empty. So, what we could do this, or sorry, we could do this um, like this, where parse name is do uh, first comes from, let's see. Oh, uh, also, we should specify that the first thing should be a letter, but the rest can be letters or numbers. So this kind of works better. Um, and then we have many alpha num. So we've talked about these kinds of combinators before, and then we return first colon rest. Um, this works. And uh, actually, I was going to talk about another way to write the same thing, but I'm not going to do that. This is fine. Uh, the other thing is I'm going to need this function again later, this parser. So I'm going to. Uh, format it and make it top level. I don't need this and I want the type. That is not the type I want. <laughs> parser uh, string, okay. Okay, so this is a new parser that just parses a name. Um, and what does parse var do? It just parses a name and then wraps it up. Okay, so that's that's all for parsing for now. I did add it to parse x, right? Yeah, I did. OK. Um, and then we'll mess with this before we move on to statements. So that's fine. OK. So now we get to look at a new type checking rule. So now we want to type check variable expressions. So what does the typing rule say? It says, gamma proves that x has type tau if a mapping from x to tau is in gamma. So that means we need to look up the name look up and uh, Haskell, which order? Oh, uh, let's see, look up and gamma name of, okay, so I'm just doing this because I wanna check that uh, I put the arguments to look up in the right order, yeah, I did, okay. So if there's nothing here, what happens? Well, if there's nothing here, just like in simply type lambda calculus, our type checking is actually going to fail. Right, we we can't type check the program. This is a type error. Um, so we actually need to make it possible now for our type checking function to fail. So we add maybe, and that affects this case too because this case is a success. So now we need to indicate that. And uh, this is all stuff that we've done before. So if there's nothing here, we fail. If there is something here, um, what do we do? Well, we return just of that thing. And uh, you might notice this case actually doesn't do anything. And so we can refactor a little bit and just get rid of the whole thing and just return return the value of lookup immediately. Okay. And so this is also an implementation of the semantics rules. So if I draw a little bit here, uh, green is probably a good color. So we have x, that's this thing. We have gamma over here, that's the same. And then tau comes from this binding, right? And that's just looking up in the environment. So the three parts of the rule, oops, the three parts of the rule translate directly to code. Does anybody have any questions about that? 
we're not doing any complicated rules with types or expressions today, but um, if this is confusing, the statements will probably be more confusing. So, okay. Cool. Uh, so then the next thing to do is to evaluate them. And uh, this one's actually going to look slightly different. And the reason it's going to look slightly different is because type checking, when we when we just made this change, type checking can fail now, right? If the type checking fails, we get a maybe type. But evaluating never fails because our type checking guarantees that the evaluation isn't going to, you know, go wrong in some sense. And you know, there are still ways that evaluation could fail, and especially once we add errors to the language, you could get, you know, divide by zero um, or stuff like that. Um, but right now, our language doesn't have errors in it, and especially evaluating a name, that's something that types prevent. So evaluating still can't fail. And so actually, if we try and evaluate a variable um, and it's not in the environment, something has gone horribly wrong. Uh, oh, whoops. Uh, that shouldn't be possible. So name of, uh, oh, the other ones are indented wrong. So if this happens, we're actually going to just crash the interpreter. So something has gone terribly wrong. The error function crashes your program. Uh, so I'm just going to put some some normal message here. Um, so so this is a nice message that tells you something went wrong. If we ever see this while we're playing with the interpreter in the REPL, uh, we know that we screwed something up, right? It's not possible for this to happen if our interpreter is working correctly. Um, and if there is something there, then we just unwrap it and return it. Uh, so this is also just an implementation of the same rule, except unlike type checking, it can't fail. So, OK, uh, I'd say that that's all we need to play with this in the interpreter, but we don't actually have a way to bind names. So we can't check that the stuff works, even though we can we can parse them. Uh, what we can do is we can check that we get type errors. So if I launch this. Oh, wait, actually, things won't type check because I didn't fix. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, OK. So we have type errors now, because type checking can fail, and also because these things need environments. So I was planning on doing this later when I got to statements, but we can do it now. So first of all, at the top level, we have two kinds of environments always going through the interpreter. On the one hand, there's the value environment, right? the values that the user has defined and what they define them as. And then there's also the typing environment, which is the types that we determined that, that those values have uh, through type inference. Uh, and at every step of evaluation, those environments can change. Uh, every time the user makes a new binding, it creates a new value binding and a new type binding. Uh, so we need to be kind of threading these environments through our top level interpreter. So. Uh, we'll carry a pair of environments around. Um, and then eval. Uh, hmm. Actually, I don't want to make this too messy. So let's just do it this way. Um, I'm basically going to rewrite this function later once we do statements. So I, I just want to do this as simply as possible. Uh, sigma gamma. Oh, uh, actually, we should. Yeah, OK, so what we should do is we should return a result and then also the new environments after. Uh, actually, there's no reason to do that because we don't have a way to change environments yet. OK, never mind. Yeah, I was planning on just going straight to statements, but now I think that would be a little bit confusing, so I'm not going to do that. OK. So if we type check. Uh, you missed uh, gamma on once in the queue. Um, I did. Thank you. I would have gotten an error, but yeah, OK. So if we type check uh, gamma, and I'm just going to leave that there and then get rid of it later, and it fails, then there is nothing we can do, right? Then, then the evaluation failed. If it succeeds, we get some type. Uh, we don't actually care, or no, we, we do care what the type is. Um, and so now we're going to return, oops, just of that type and the result of evaluating E in SIG, OK? Does, does that make sense? So now we type check first. We determine if the type checking succeeded or failed. And only if it succeeded 
then we evaluate E. Okay. Um, Uh, and so now here, uh, this is going to get a little bit messier because now we have to check if the evaluation succeeded. Um, what is going on here? Yeah, okay. So now we need a case here. So this is case uh, REPL eval E. And uh, well, we need some environments here. So I'm just going to pretend we have them now and we'll fix that in a second. Thing. Uh, we'll come back to this. And then we get a result and some new environments. Or no, we didn't do that yet. Okay. Just a just a result. Yeah. Uh, but hang on. The result is still a pair. It's just a different pair, right? So now we have a type. And, oh, REPL pretty takes a result. Okay, never mind. Yep, yep, yep. This is fine. And now we put string line. REPL spelling is hard. R. Okay. Uh, and then we loop. Okay. Uh, I'm going to write this slightly differently. Okay. So now we have this problem where we used ENVs here, but we don't actually have any. Uh, what's going to happen is in a couple of minutes, we're going to start writing code for statements. When we evaluate statements, the statement is going to take some environments as input and return new environments potentially as output. And we're going to need to manually thread those things around. And so actually what we want is we want this REPL function to take uh, the environments that it should use for the current step. Because remember, REPL executes the current step of our loop. Uh, and so actually, now we want this to take environments as an argument. Uh, and when we loop, we're going to have to pass some environments along. In this case, they can't change. That's OK. This will change in a second. In this case, we want to do something. Um, we're going to print a message. But I'm just going to get to that when I do statements instead of worrying about it right now. Um, so we'll we'll do something more interesting in this case later. Uh, so okay, going all the way back up to the top of the file. Oh, actually, hang on. Before I move on to statements, did anybody have questions about any of that? Uh, everything should type check now. So if I load this up, yeah, okay. And if I wait, actually, why did everything type check? Main has the wrong type. Um, the initial environment just has nothing in it. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now if I do this, yeah, we can parse names now. So, so this wasn't a parse error. Uh, what happened was it parsed the name, then it tried to type check it. The type checking failed because there was no binding for X in the typing environment. Uh, and then because I left undefined here, the, the program crashed. So uh, this is expected behavior. So the expected thing is happening. That's a good sign. So just to double check again, did anybody have any questions? Doesn't seem like it. OK, so let's get that out of the way. OK, so now the new thing is we're going to have a new type for statements. So expressions are you know things that have a value, like 3 plus 5 or a function call. Statements are a way to interact with the interpreter. So you can query this, the interpreter to evaluate an expression for you. That's a statement that you know, doesn't do anything. The statement is just an expression. You can also ask the interpreter to add a new binding to the environment for you. We call that a let binding. So we're going to have statements for both. Um, so first, there's what we call an anonymous statement. That's just asking the interpreter to evaluate an expression for you. Um, and I'll talk about the syntax of these things in the language in a second. Uh, didn't go quite far enough. So this is let x equal. Okay. Okay. So in the syntax of the language, if you remember from the first meeting, uh, whenever you enter a line at the interpreter, you put this double semicolon after it. So the anonymous statement is just an expression followed by a double semicolon. The let statement is a let binding. Let 
x be defined as an expression followed by the double semicolon. So before we even talk about semantics, we can just go figure out how to parse those. You know, you, you don't need to understand semantics to, to parse things. Um, why is it highlighting? Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, get out of there. Um, OK, so first of all, our parser is not going to return an expression anymore. It's going to return a statement. Um, la -dee -da. So now we have this parse statement function that we need to write. And actually, I called this statement in reference code. So OK, since there's two cases uh, of the statement type, we can expect there to be two cases in this function, just like there is for parse expression. So parse your statement. Our statement equals do. Oh, what did I? Yeah, okay, do. Uh, and okay, so we're going to write this one a little bit differently from parse expression, and the reason is because of that double semicolon at the end. So every statement type has the double semicolon at the end. So what we want to do is we want to parse a statement, which is either a let statement or an anonymous statement, followed by the double semicolon. And then we return the statement. Um, OK, so I'm not going to fix this today, but I do want to point out an issue here. Uh, none of these things can parse spaces. So you can't put spaces between your expression and your double semicolon or any kind of white space. But syntactically, those things should be allowed. Um, solving this problem manually is actually kind of tricky. But the parsing library that we're using has tools for doing it called language parsers, which you know, sounds convenient because we're writing a language. So I'm not going to mess with using that stuff today because today I wanted to talk about semantics and then start showing how to translate semantics rules into code. Next week, uh, either silently, like I won't talk about it in the video, I'll just put it in the reference code um, that I post, or I will talk about it in the video. Uh, we'll fix that. We'll start using the real parsing systems. Um, part of the reason that we want to do that is because parsing operators is hard. And we'll talk about that when we get there. And this library can do it for you uh, if you let it help you. And I really want to do that because I don't want to deal with parsing operators on my own. No one ever wants to deal with parsing operators on their own. It's a mess. Um, and I'm sure Reed can confirm that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so OK, back to what we were doing. Uh, so first, uh, actually, let's parse anonymous statements first because it's a little easier. Parser statement. So remember, an anonymous statement is just an expression. So there's literally nothing to do here. We just parse an expression and wrap it up. The let expression is a little bit more involved, or sorry, the let statement. Um, parser statement. So now there's a few things that we need to parse in sequence. And so now, because syntactically there need to be some spaces here, we're going to have to manually insert some parsers for, spacers, for spaces. And we'll fix this later when we start doing things the right way. Uh, that was a big error. Uh, OK. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but try is a combinator uh, that takes a parser as an argument and returns a parser that parses the same thing. But if the parser fails, it backtracks. Um, and that's relevant because let is a keyword. So if you have a variable name that starts with the word let, but then keeps going. Uh, if you tried to parse let statement before parse anonymous statement, which is what we're doing up here, um, and you see the word let followed by stuff, you would get a parsing error instead of actually getting a, late, a let statement. So this is another thing that we won't have to worry about once we're actually using the proper language parsing feature. I just didn't want to have to talk about uh, how to do that today didn't want to talk about the fact that it exists. Um, da -da -da -da. OK, so we parse the word. We parse a variable name. We parse an equal sign surrounded by parentheses. We parse an expression. That's the body. And then we return our let statement. And then to make things look pretty, we press all the keys. And hey, now it looks pretty. Uh, OK, so, so this is all the parsing. Um, so there's going to be some type errors at the bottom of the file now. You can see it says there's an error. Uh, that's at the bottom because the parser doesn't return an expression anymore. 
um, but that's okay. So now we know how to parse these things. And now uh, we don't need to change our type checking rules or our evaluation rules for uh, statements because statements aren't things that we evaluate, right? Statements are, are instructions for the interpreter. So instead of, uh, what am I doing? So instead of doing those things, we can actually just go all the way down here. Uh, and we're going to need to make some changes to the REPL part of the code. So, so this is what I was getting at earlier when I said I wasn't planning on messing with this for, for variables. So, okay. Read doesn't read an expression anymore. It reads a statement. But other than that, it's exactly the same. We've talked about how this function works before. There's nothing new. Eval is going to get quite a bit more involved because now eval isn't just evaluating an expression. It's also uh, you know, executing a statement if necessary. If it needs to create a new binding, it needs to do that. Um, so like I said earlier, now uh, we need to take environments. And we also potentially need to return new environments to use. Um, so we take top ends. We also return, return top ends. So when you execute a statement, if the statement says that you should add new bindings to the environments, then REPL eval will return the, the new resulting environments, which is uh, what we want. And so now I'm just going to throw this away because it's basically useless now. And we have to re-implement this function. So uh, there's two cases, right? Because there's two types of statements. So the first type of statement is anonymous. Uh, and then I'm going to use an as pattern, which I've talked about before. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is because I know that the environments aren't going to change. So we're just going to want to return the same pair. So, all right, first we want to type check the expression in, our, in the current typing environment. And then we want to evaluate in the current value environment. And we inspect, did type checking succeed? If not, we fail. If type checking did succeed, uh, we're going to create a new value environment with that binding. Oh, wait, hang on. What am I doing? I'm doing the, am I doing the wrong rule? I am doing the wrong rule. Whoops, whoopsies. There we go. OK, sorry about that. If type checking succeeds, we return a result with the type and the correct value and the same environments. OK, there we go. Sorry, that was probably confusing. Um, so there is one thing I want to point out here, um, because I don't actually know if I've mentioned this before. Um, you might notice that this let binding here says to evaluate E uh, before we've checked whether or not type checking succeeded. So you might ask if, if type checking fails, isn't that going to, going to cause problems? So actually, Haskell has a property called laziness. And that means that the Haskell compiler, or, or the Haskell runtime, is never going to actually compute an expression um, until it's needed. So over here, when we inspect uh, mtau, which is short for maybe tau, and we find that it's nothing, the runtime will go, oh, I didn't actually need v at all, and it'll just never compute it. And so this error condition up here on line 170 uh, just won't happen, right? Even if it would happen had we, had we tried to evaluate this. Uh, and that turns out to be useful in a lot of places. In this case, it's making the code cleaner. Um, when we implement recursive bindings later, it's going to make our implementation way, way simpler than the implementation in the OCaml interpreter that we're basing this off of. Like, Way simpler. It's not even funny. Um, but OK. So we just implemented the rule for anonymous statements. So now I want to look over here at the semantics and talk about how it's the same. So I'm going to draw a bunch again. So OK. You'll notice that the statement semantics rules have some different things on the bottom. So whereas the expression semantics had an expression, an environment, and a value on the right, the statements have a statement and two environments on the left and a value and two environments on the right. Um, actually, this should be a value and a type, but it was starting to get really cluttered. So I just simplified it a little bit. Um, so OK, if we look over here, we can see these things are this part of the code. They are the arguments to our evaluate function. 
And then above the line, there's a thing. That means that we need to do the thing above the line before we can return a result. So what does this say? It says we need to evaluate the expression E uh, in the environment sigma um, to a value V. And so we can see we do that part here. Uh, in the semantics, I, I didn't specify this. You do also have to type check E to make sure that it type checks, but then you throw the result away. So I didn't put that in the semantics, but you know, for sanity's sake, you do have to have to do the type checking step. Okay. And then once you have done the thing above the line, well, now you know what V is because you, you've evaluated E. And so now you can get your value. So that's this part and your environments, that's this part, and return them, okay? So this, uh, this code is almost a direct translation of the rule. The rule says in order to execute this kind of statement, you first evaluate this thing, and then you just return this. And the only reason it's a little bit more complicated is because we have to handle type checking failing. And uh, the statement semantics don't specify exactly how to do that, so we're doing that on top of the semantics. but. Does anybody have any questions about how the semantics turns into code, or is this clear? Okay, sounds like it's clear. So I'm going to go ahead and do the other one, which is a little bit more involved, and so I want to talk about it first. Okay, there we go. So you'll see this rule is a little bit more involved, but really, it looks very similar. So, you know, we see there's the same kind of thing, you know, there's still an E. So like this is still here. We still have the environments. We still have this thing above the line, right? So we need to do the same things first. Uh, fighting with Zoom, okay. Um, but now there's, there's also this type checking thing. So really that should have been there for anonymous statements too. That's just, you know, this part of type checking, which we already did. So nothing new there. What's interesting now is in the result, we're not going to return the same kind of the same environments that we got as input. So these are two different syntaxes that say the same thing. And again, this is because type theorists and programming language semantics people disagree about what notation to use to say the same thing. Um, so for the value environment here, this says you take the environment sigma. So this is the, the same sigma as over there. Uh, but you introduce a new binding that binds x to v. Uh, so if there's already a binding for x and sigma, you shadow it. And if there isn't a binding for x and sigma, then now there is. And then this notation for gamma is exactly the same. It says you take a type binding, you say x has type tau, and you add that to gamma. And they, they mean exactly the same thing. They're just written differently. Um, so, okay, understanding that, now we can just go and try and implement it. And so the first part should look very similar to anonymous statements, right? Because, um, you know, the, the thing above the line is the same. We're, we're really kind of at its core doing the same thing. We're just not throwing away the result. And that was why I started writing the wrong code earlier when I was doing anonymous statements. It's because I was looking at the wrong one and I couldn't tell because they're so similar. So again, we have our environments. We have the same thing, type check E, evaluate E, check if type checking succeeded. If it didn't, there's nothing we can do. If it did succeed, then now there's a little bit more work that we can do. So now we want to create our new value and type environments. So we have sigma prime, which is the result of inserting the binding for x to v into sigma. Uh, oops. We have gamma prime, which is the same thing, but for the type environment. Uh, and then we can construct our new environments pair, which is just sigma prime, gamma prime. And now we return our result. And our result says it should be v. We're going to return the type as well, because we print it back. So our result is V as well as both of the new environments. So that's type, value, and ends prime. 
And why is it complaining? It's supposed to be a maybe. Ah, thank you. OK, yeah. So we return a success value containing type value and our new environments. Um, OK, so now uh, we could go all the way down here and just fix this stuff immediately. Um, one thing that we can do is we can make these names a little better. These aren't state or these aren't expressions anymore. Now they're statements. So we can, you know, use better names. Uh, whoops. Um, but okay, so now now here's a slightly more complicated problem that's not so easy to fix. Uh, this thing is no longer just a result. Now it's result and potentially new environments. So now what we need is we still have a result. But we also have uh, environments. And we need to update the REPL so that on the next loop, it uses the new environments. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, uh, can you guys see the, the Zoom gallery on the right side of my screen? No, we can't. OK, good, because it's covering the code for me. It would have been awkward if it's been covering some of the code the whole time. OK. Um, so we're going to have to update our pretty function so that it can uh, print the result because the result is more complicated now. Um, but we can do that in a second. And then here, we pass the new environments to uh, the next iteration of REPL. So this is how you handle stateful updating in Haskell. You take the state that you want to use initially as an argument, and you return a new state as an output. And we may talk in the future about a nicer way to do that without having to do everything by hand, because doing everything by hand sucks. Um, and then the other thing is this line is getting long, so I'm just going to use a do block to break it up. OK. So now uh, everything actually uh, type checks here. Uh, Haskell is happy with this. But we're missing this, uh, this definition here, right? This is still undefined. So what we're going to do is we're going to update REPL pretty so that uh, it's a little bit nicer, and it can actually do something when type checking fails. Um, so instead of taking a result, we're going to take a maybe result. Um, and if we get nothing, we're going to print the super helpful error message that tells you exactly what went wrong, did not type check. Uh, oops, what did I just do? Um, and in the future, we will uh, maybe make our type errors a little bit more interesting, or I might just leave that as an exercise. Um, it's not super hard, but you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, and then, OK, so there, there's nothing else to really do here. The same, this case stays the same. Uh, if you remember, this isn't actually very pretty. So this is a badly named function. And I would still encourage, uh, if you're interested, to try and write a better function. That should be really easy. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is just to make life a little bit easier. Um, I'm going to just write a function that does the put string line part for me. So this is pretty common in Haskell. You build small functions out of other functions that do different things. So now this function takes a maybe result and just prints it immediately instead of returning it as a string. And so now here, instead of calling both of these, I just have to call REPL print, and it's the same. So REPL print result. Uh, REPL print just result. And then here, we REPL print nothing. OK. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions? OK, good. So if there's no questions about that, that's actually super cool, because that's all the code. Uh, so now we can go launch the REPL and look at it. So reload. Launch main. So uh, again, oh, that, oh yeah. So we need the double semicolons now. So if I just put a variable name, it doesn't type check. If I do this, it won't parse. Uh, did, oh, oops, I forgot a step. We REPL print nothing, and then we have to actually call the REPL again. It's a loop. I was like, what happened? So, so what happened here is the interpreter exited after the type checking failed. Uh, so OK, if I do this, it won't parse, because you can't put double semicolon after 
after let because let is a keyword, right? But if I give a name like letter, that still didn't work. Eh. Uh, okay. Um, I'll have to look at that. I suspect that that's because spaces parses zero or more spaces instead of one or more spaces. Um, but I'm not actually sure. Anyway, okay. Uh, if I use a reasonable name like foo, right? Nope, that's not the problem either. What is the problem? Unexpected O. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So the issue that we're running into here is that uh, false is a keyword just like just like let was, and false starts with the same letter as foo. And so we're running into that same backtracking issue that we were running into before. This is the same problem that is going to get solved by using the proper language parsing tools. And so I'm not going to worry about fixing this right now. I'm going to use a name that doesn't start with the same letter as a keyword. Now we get did not type check, right? Like we would expect. And the REPL keeps going, which is great. Um, okay. So now we can we can actually introduce new bindings. We still can't make useful expressions, right? The only expressions that we have are constants, but we can do something like this. And it will tell us that the result is five, that it's an integer. And now we have x in our environment. And so now if we do x again, it does type check and we get the same result. Uh, we can bind y to the same value as x. And this works just fine. So now we have names in our language in the simplest form. And names themselves don't actually ever get any more complicated than this. So this rule will always be this simple, which is great. It's just the other expressions that we build on top of them will add new rules and some more code each time. Um, and so we're just going to keep going step by step. I think next week um, might do, I was thinking of doing some operators, but I don't want to talk too much about parsing in one week. And I think if we do operators, I'll end up talking about parsing almost the whole time. And that would be too much parsing for me at least. I, I enjoy parsing, but that that's a bit much. Um, so I'm not sure what else we could do. Do you have any ideas, Reed? Um, you can do if, then, else. Yeah, sure. OK. Um, yeah, so we yeah. can do uh, if, then, else next week, and then also talk about the right way to parse these things. And I think we'll probably end up spending most of the time talking about parsing. Um, but that's okay. If then else is relatively simple. Got to do non-recursive like lambdas. Yeah, but that's a lot of parsing work. Um, sure. Yeah. Whatever. We'll see. Uh, well, uh, okay. Lambdas aren't that bad, but yeah. Uh, I, I think I can probably take up pretty much all of the time talking about how to properly use language parsers and then doing if then else. So I think that should be okay. okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about what we did today or the end result that we got or the code yeah, or um, I have a small question. Um, yeah. So in the formal rule for a let, it's using let x colon equals e, uh, but in our grammar, we're actually just using equals and not colon equals. Does the colon equals have like special meaning in the rule? Uh, um, that's a typo because there's a colon equals here and the class that oh, I work okay. for that teaches big step semantics uses colon equals in their let bindings too. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'll fix that. Good eye though. I looked at this like 10 times and didn't notice that. <laughs> uh, I'll also add the, the type checking premise to the anonymous rule. Uh, because it, it really should be there. Leaving it off was a bad decision. Um, so, OK, I, I guess the other thing I could mention, I was kind of talking about this before we started, but that was before we started, so it's not in the recording. Uh, normally, when you look at the semantics for a programming language, uh, people are talking about the semantics of the language as it's compiled, not as it's interpreted. And so you would see the type checking semantics and the evaluation semantics are totally separate and they never interact at all. Um, and that's okay, that, that's fine because all of the interesting parts happen separately. But when you have an interpreter uh, where the user is you know, entering expressions one at a time, you really do need to mix type checking and evaluation. So I have this type checking premise 
in what's really an execution semantic. And that's very unusual. You will probably never see that anywhere else. And that's OK. The important thing is that it makes sense. So again, the things above the lines are called premises. So this is, if you can see my cursor, this is the type checking premise. But yeah. So OK, if there's nothing else, that actually took almost exactly an hour. So. Well, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Um...